Alarming details have emerged from the inquiry into the workplace culture in federal parliament, sparked by the alleged rape of a staffer in a minister's office. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And to top off a tumultuous year in Canberra, Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins last week released a damning report into the workplace culture at Parliament House, which revealed a toxic environment of bullying and sexual harassment. One in two of the workers that are there right now have experienced bullying, sexual harassment or sexual assault. And some of the experiences shared with the Commission were shocking. The MP sitting behind me leaned over. He grabbed me and stuck his tongue down my throat. The others all laughed. The report made a big splash on the front page of the West Australian, which called it horrifying and sparked a similar reaction on ABC's The Drum. This is extraordinary. And it was also a hot topic on Nine's Today Show and on Studio 10. We should never, as a country, be in this position ever again. It's been a long time coming and these figures are terrifying. Oh, they are. Absolutely. But over on Sky's Paul Murray Live, they had a very different take, featuring an all-male panel and this disclaimer. Look, I get it, it's four blokes talking about it on telly, but alas, we cannot change who we are or how we identify, but we are part of the inclusive discussion. And just who was included? Paul Murray, Nicholas Rees, Chris Kenny and Mark Latham, now leader of One Nation New South Wales, who had this to say. It doesn't accord with the experience I had there for a decade, and they say these problems go back decades. It, it, it doesn't uh, feel to me like it's evidence-based. Well, actually, Mark, it was based on plenty of evidence, including 302 written submissions, 490 interviews, and a survey of almost 1,000 current workers. But Sky stablemate Chris Kenny also queried whether the findings could be trusted. The survey itself was an anonymous survey and less than a quarter of the people it was sent to returned any answers, so right. it's not a representative survey. That left the third male panellist, Nicholas Rees, who is Melbourne's Deputy Lord Mayor, to defend the report on his own. We should all be you, sitting you here, we should all be sitting here woman, saying wow, we are going to be champions street. of change. This panel should be yeah. universally oh, saying we oh, are champions oh, of change. Come on, we're not going to stand for this stuff Nicholas, anymore. You, and three minutes later, when he called them out, it did not get any better. I am honestly just appalled that every comment I've heard from you in this debate so far tonight, you're trying to downplay or discredit the findings and not talk up the seriousness of it. It's unacceptable. We have to do something about the people it. Who We've responded. got to drive That's change good. here. And in case we hadn't heard enough from old white males, Graham Richardson had given us his view two hours earlier on Sky's Christmas Tonight. I don't think that, uh, that there needs to be a turning point. I don't believe that the culture in Parliament House is as bad as people are trying to make out. But you, sh you can't get carried away with a few complaints. However, unlike Paul Murray, Chris Smith understood the fundamental need to include a female voice and had Prue McSween there to battle it out with the blokey battalion. The problem with Parliament House, as I see it, is this whole Canberra bubble, which is like a boys club. They're in denial. That is absurd. This is the problem. Until they accept that there is a problem and stop kidding themselves. And you could say the same for the old blokes at Sky who were almost beyond parody in that response. But now to allegations of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan and of ABC fake news. The ABC needs to wake up and accept that they've got this wrong. Back in October 2020, one of the ABC's top reporters, Mark Willisey, working with the investigative unit, accused Australian commandos in the 2nd Regiment's November platoon of executing a bound and unarmed Afghan prisoner in mid-2012. US Marine says Australian Special Forces soldiers made deliberate decision to break the rules of war. The ABC's source was an ex-US Marine who didn't want to be identified for fear of retribution, but was happy to go on camera using a pseudonym Josh. The former crew chief was a helicopter door gunner on a night raid with the commandos in northern Helmand province in mid-2012, in which the Australians had taken prisoners. We just watched them hogtie these guys, and we knew their hands were, you know, tied behind their backs. He says the Australians called the US pilots to pick them up, as well as seven prisoners. But the pilot told them there was only room on the aircraft for six. And you just heard a silence, and then we heard a pop. And then they said, OK, we have six prisoners. Um, and so it was pretty apparent to everybody involved in that mission that they had just killed a prisoner, that we had just watched them, like, catch and hog cut. The US Marine was the ABC's sole witness to the killing, and he'd not actually seen it happen. And that is the difficulty with this story. 
Now, it must be said, Mark Willisey has done amazing work to uncover alleged war crimes, and last year he won Australian journalism's highest accolade, the Gold Walkley, for his Four Corners story, Killing Fields, which revealed this damning footage of an Australian soldier shooting an unarmed Afghan prisoner. In the man's hand appears to be a set of red prayer beads. No weapon or radio can be seen. The Afghan is compliant and quiet on the ground. Down. Quick, no! Quick! Stop! Leave! Three shots from close range. The Afghan is dead, and Soldier C walks off. Willis's stories over the last two years, around two dozen in number, have prompted several investigations. And his book, Rogue Forces, published in August, had shocking new revelations. Other journalists who've done pioneering work in this area, like Chris Masters and Nick McKenzie, told Media Watch that Millicy is brave and principled. But his story on November Platoon has come under heavy fire, chiefly from Platoon Commander Heston Russell, who was not identified by the ABC, who dismissed the allegations on the Sunday project days after the story went to air. You were the commanding officer mm -hmm. with the platoon all the time. Yep. And you never saw anything that has been alleged. Absolutely, that is correct. And you say that no prisoner was ever summarily executed that you saw? So we're responding to the direct allegation that this Marine on a mission heard seven detainees turn to six and heard a pop, and that that was the execution, and that never happened. And in the last few weeks, Russell has ramped up the pressure by writing an open letter to the ABC to say... This is an appalling and preposterous lie. The ABC carries the responsibility of this gross failing of basic journalistic practice. Russell's repeated his claim several times on Sky News and also championing his cause has been 2GB's Ben Fordham, who has covered the story 15 times in the last five weeks and hammered the ABC in interviews and editorials demanding that Willisey and the ABC take action. What a shameful and embarrassing situation this is. The ABC needs to wake up and accept that they've got this wrong. Mark, this one is garbage. Meanwhile, there has been abuse and worse on social media, with one person posting this video of Willis's book being doused with petrol and set on fire. And another video of this former ADF member at a shooting range in Thailand loading his automatic weapon and asking... You want me to drop this gun? before letting off a burst of gunfire at what turns out to be Willis's book. And when Willis posted that clip on Twitter, Heston Russell responded... Nothing short of what you deserve, Mark Willis. -y. And it gets worse. Recently, the reporter received a message on his mobile phone as he sat in bed reading the papers at 5.40 in the morning. Hey, Mark, you pedophile c I hope your kids get COVID. And I'm going to find your old lady and slit her throat, you fucking dog. A man has now been arrested by Victoria Police. And if anyone thinks such threats aren't serious, then consider this recent story by Mark Willisey. Defence Force relocates key war crimes witness after blast at her New South Wales home. I was terrified, and I still am. I still wake up at 3.30 in the morning. Captain Louise said... That witness, Captain Louise, whose windows were blown out by a mystery blast, is the ex-wife of Soldier C in Willis's Four Corners. But... Awful as all that is, to ask the issues to consider about the ABC's November platoon story, where a petition demanding an independent review of its allegations has now gathered almost 25,000 signatures. Two weeks ago, the ABC announced that Audience and Consumer Affairs is now investigating Russell's official complaint about the programme. So what are they likely to find? Well, the key problem is that the ABC had only one witness to the alleged killing and he did not actually see the prisoner being shot. The US Marine heard a pop over the radio and was told that seven prisoners were now six. And while other members of the US helicopter crew supposedly heard what he heard and reached the same conclusion, the ABC had none of them to back him up. So why does the ABC believe that is enough? It told us in a statement. The story was based on credible information from interviews with multiple confidential sources in Australia and the US. But the fact remains that only one of them witnessed the alleged killing. The ABC also says there is now... ..an active criminal investigation into the conduct of an Australian commando platoon in Afghanistan in 2012. 
And to back up that claim, the ABC has cited the fact that Defence rejected its FOI application on the grounds that supplying information could compromise a current investigation. However, in publishing the FOI documents, the ABC has not helped its case, because in seeking, quote, Audio copies of recorded mission communications for November platoon during missions in Afghanistan and enemy killed in action data. The ABC declared it was looking at the period between 1 June 2012 and 31 July 2012, when they say the alleged killing took place. And Heston Russell maintains his men were not in the area at that time. There were no deployments into Helmand, Afghanistan during the months of June, July or, or even August by November platoon. So as has been revealed, this story is not only infactual, it's impossible. In response to that, the ABC has now changed its online story from saying it sought the FOI material covering June and July 2012 to across 2012 and added an editor's note to say... The story has been amended to better reflect the ABC's FOI application. Which is a strange way of acknowledging that they screwed up on the dates. So, what is the verdict? Well, we're certainly not saying the story's wrong or that it didn't happen. That'll be up to a criminal investigation to decide. And we're also not going to tell you that November Platoon was squeaky clean. In 2019, Chris Masters and Nick McKenzie revealed in The Age that a former commando from November Platoon had confessed to killing an unarmed Afghan prisoner in 2012. One summary execution being investigated by the Brereton Inquiry was carried out by a member of the commando's November Platoon during an operation in southern Afghanistan on October the 3rd, 2012. But despite all that, we do have an issue with Willis's story. And for us, it is this. Should the ABC have asked more questions and found more support for the allegation before publishing? And from what we've seen, the answer is yes. Mark Willis and ABC Investigations have a great track record. We certainly don't believe their story was garbage or fabricated, as Ben Fordham and Heston Russell have called it. But we believe the ABC pressed publish too soon and should either have waited or told viewers the allegation of unlawful killing was uncorroborated and might not be true. It should also have given Heston Russell a right to answer the allegations once he'd made clear back in October 2020 that he was the November platoon's commander. We'll see what happens to that complaint. But in the meantime, the ABC Investigations Unit has hit back at Russell by publishing this story on the weekend. Former soldier and Values Party founder Heston Russell lied about selling porn online while fundraising for veterans charity. ABC Investigations has obtained evidence that Mr Russell sold explicit images via OnlyFans charging $60 US on Anzac Day last year for a picture of himself holding his erect penis. Russell says the story is a deliberate attack on his character. And on this occasion, the ABC did go to him for comment. He did not deny selling the images, but declined a recorded interview. And you can read statements to Media Watch from Heston Russell and the ABC on our website. But now to a topic we've tackled before, the way in which advertising encroaches on news and to something that shocked even us. We'll catch up with our resident racing experts. Sorry about this, guys. Kind of in the middle of something, mate. What's going on, Simon? Did you want a cafe, caramel, hazelnut or vanilla iced coffee? I'll take a caramel one. Thanks for that. That is Seven's resident regional sports jock, Nathan Sperling, taking a call at the news desk from colleague Simon Nichols, who's off on a coffee run, as you do. And Nathan wasn't just thirsty, he was peckish as well. Oh, hang on, you there? Yep, I'll grab a Big Mac too. Cheers. No worries, mate. Thanks for that, mate. Beautiful. Beautiful. What a guy. And then Nathan got back to work. Anyway, guys, uh, sorry for that little uh, interruption. Just a little interruption, more likely a bloody big ad, topped with the jingle from You Know Who. Thank you. Awesome. That fake news cameo runs in ad breaks during the real news in Seven's regional bulletin produced on the Sunshine Coast. And it's been running for weeks across Queensland, from Toowoomba to Bundaberg, Rockhampton, Townsville and Cairns. Real journalists on the real news set selling coffee and burgers. Unbelievable. As is the fact that it was Seven's idea. And the journalists weren't even paid by Maccas. It's apparently part of their job these days. All in all, a depressing new low. And even worse than this greasy job on Nine's Today Show last year. I've got the new uh, McDonald's McChicken range here this morning. Do you guys want some chips with your, um, your chicken salt, your seasoning? You can do your McShaker fries. So I've got to tell you, this is the best burger I've ever had. That is a great burger. 
Yes, Karl Stefanovic loved the burger because Nine got a truckload of money to make him love it. That earned Nine a slap from the broadcast regulator in July, with ACMA chair Nerida O'Loughlin calling it a clear breach of the rules and adding... This kind of blurring of the lines between advertising and program content breaks down the audience's trust in what they are seeing. And you could say exactly the same thing about the Macca's ads dressed up as news on Seven. But, given they are in an ad break, there's nothing in the commercial TV code that stops Seven from doing it. And do they have any shame in tricking viewers for money? Absolutely not. Telling us in a statement... Seven is confident its viewers would understand these are clearly advertisements. Maccas did not want to comment, but they must be thrilled that Seven agreed to bend over so far. And finally, an extraordinary apology from Peter Credlin. Back in June 2020, MediaWatch took the Sky News host to task for saying this about the Sudanese community in Melbourne, whom she blamed for triggering a COVID cluster during end of Ramadan celebrations. According to community leaders, Melbourne's South Sudanese weren't really aware of the rules. Although community health messages were printed in the language of Dinka, many Sudanese migrants can't speak, can speak Dinka, but they can't actually read it. So, illiterate and Muslim, although 90% of them are, in fact, Christians. And that wasn't the end of Credlin's insults. If the culture is about gang membership, unemployment and an inability to speak Australia's national language, the point of not even knowing about social distancing, doesn't that have to change urgently for everyone's good? In the outrage that followed, Credlin issued a limited apology. But on Friday night, she was forced to go the full Monty with a four-minute statement, a bit like a hostage video. This was factually wrong, and I again deeply regret the error. On the basis of that error, I made various other statements that I accept have caused genuine hurt and offence to South Sudanese community members. It was not my intention. I extend to the South Sudanese community my sincerest apologies for these errors and the hurt, humiliation and offence caused by the broadcasts. We understand Credlin was compelled to apologise to settle a racial discrimination complaint before the Australian Human Rights Commission. And she surely wins Apology of the Year. And uh, talking of that, I'm afraid that is all from us tonight and for 2021. Thanks to everyone who sent us tips or asked us to investigate stories. And thanks to everyone in the media who has taken the effort to respond to our queries. We'll all be back to go another round next year. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>